1 John um, chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, we, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim pro concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Thank you, Janet. We do invite our ecumenical friends to join us and sometimes they do. And we've already had uh, greetings from Bishop Paul and Stephen Lindridge. But I noticed that Joanne Thorns is Joanne Thorns is with us. So greetings to you, Joanne. Joanne is the regional officer for Northeast Churches Acting Together. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we recognise that you had uh, two or three options uh, to join in this morning. And so we thank you for actually joining with us. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share God's word with you. Uh, it's been my privilege of serving you over these past 20 years. And a privilege, too, to serve with so many hardworking and encouraging people. Thank you for the blessing that you've been to me uh, over all these years. It was an unexpected privilege to come and to serve in the North. I never anticipated it at all. Having been appointed in my mid-30s to serve the East Midlands Association and at the same time a small church in Nottingham, I we then moved to Durham. And I remember teasing someone from Nottingham a supporter of Notts County, who play in black and white, just in case you don't know, and teasing that person and saying to them, well, I was actually moving to an area where the black and whites actually win. Well, maybe, and sometimes. It's my privilege to serve across the churches and within our churches and to walk very close with, me with many of them, including many of the smallest, but also the largest, and to journey in times of joy, and sometimes, sadly, in times of woe. And to represent our Baptist family here, and to represent us in the wider ecumenical and Baptist world. And I found that my eyes have been open, my heart's been touched, my mind's been engaged, and the whole time has brought many blessings, some challenges, a few frustrations, sometimes sadness, but also many times of fun. But our focus is upon Jesus. For it's all about Jesus. I mean, it's all that excites us or frustrates us, all that we despair over or hope for, beyond all our so-called strength and our obvious weaknesses. It is Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, as the writer of the Hebrews says. And so we turn to him, the life we proclaim, and his life proclaimed to us. John, in his letter, is concerned to check out a few things uh, with those he's writing to. He wants to check out what we believe. 
a theology, if you like, especially what we believe about Jesus, who is the revelation of God, the word made flesh. He wants to check out what we do. In other words, how we live, our ethics, our morality, how we as the people of Jesus, as the people of God, reflect the righteous standards of God in daily life. And what we are as loving people how we love one another, how is God's love expressed amongst us and through us to a wider world, but first to Jesus. So I'm going to help us to explore this passage by thinking firstly about the life we proclaim as being the life of Jesus, God in flesh dwelling among us. The life we proclaim is the life of Jesus in you and in me, and in us. And so flowing from that is the life we proclaim, is the life of Jesus in the life that we have together in Jesus. The life that we proclaim, the one life we reflect on and make known is the life of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I can't help, and I've often felt this, I can't help that sense of wonder that John would have had when as he grew older, as he wrote the gospel, as he wrote these letters, as he reflected on the life of Jesus on this earth, I can't help but appreciate the sense of wonder at the word made flesh. In John chapter 1, and there are many links between 1 John 1 and John 1, in John chapter 1 we read the words, we beheld his glory. And this is more than the whimsical thoughts of an old fella looking back over maybe 50 or 60 years, who knows, perhaps even slightly longer. More than that, it's that sense of wonder that he had walked the paths of Galilee, the shores of the sea, the streets of Jerusalem, and seen the wonder of God revealed in Jesus. And God is excited about, about it, even in his old age. His memory is stirred at the historic reality of being with Jesus, that which we heard, he says, that which we saw, we have seen, that which we touched. And the events could have come in, flood, flooding back into his mind. He says, we have seen it. It's as though he could have written several more chapters recalling the events of seeing Jesus touch people's lives, challenge people in authority, change situations, transform things and even affect the course of nature as he stilled the waves. But he moves from words like heard and seen and touched to a slightly different word, that which we looked at. Looked at intently. That which we beheld, he said. That which we gazed in wonder. That we reflected in depth. And his knowledge of the life of Jesus and his experience of being with Jesus led him into a deeper appreciation, appreciation of the realities of Jesus. And so we see a deepened understanding. It is the word, and I don't know about your versions and your print uh, in your copies of the Bible, but my word, word of life, in that phrase, is a capital W. A deepening understanding that not only did Jesus speak words, but he was the word of life. Again, a theme that comes in in 1 John, that word logos. The principle of life behind the universe, as the Greek would have said. Or as the Hebrews would have said, a word of life spoken at creation. This word is made flesh and in him was life. And it's life too to John. And it's life too to us. It is the eternal life that has come in the person of Jesus, the one that was with the Father who appeared to us, the incarnation, and the reality that Christmas is a joy for all seasons. He speaks of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in verse 3. And they're picking up Peter's remarkable confession. You are the Christ, Son of the living God. The life we proclaim is the life of Jesus. And we do so with authority and compassion and clarity and humility. We do so in the authority given by the risen Christ. Go and make disciples, be witnesses, preach good news. 
We do so in the compassion of Christ, following the example of Christ, who was so often, we read, moved with compassion and filled with a spirit who fills our hearts with love. You do so with humility as the pattern of Jesus and with clarity that engages, informs and inspires. This is the life we are called to proclaim. And that challenges us because it challenges us, saying it's not about our projects and our activities, our theologies and our descriptions, our old and new emphasis, whether in mission or ministry or other aspects of church life, our traditions and customs. It's not about those things. It's not about our image of the ideal church, whatever that might be. And all those may have their place. And we can debate such things, but our passion for Jesus must be unabated or is about Jesus. But it is about the God-man before the method. It is about the purpose of the king before the processes and programs of the church, that they may be tools for service. And this is what the scripture proclaims to us about Jesus in the Gospels and in the whole scripture. That is to be determinative for how we approach all things. It finds its focus in revelation, redemption and reconciliation. It's a life we proclaim and proclaim we must. And the NIV that Janet read from uh, uses the word proclaim, but it can equally be translated as announce. Just make known. Three times John uses that word, proclaim or announce. He also says testify or declare and to write. It's a reminder to us that example helps. Example and good lifestyle is right, but telling is necessary. Communication is important. Paul says, how will they hear without a preacher, without someone who articulates the good news of Jesus Christ? Not necessarily from the pulpit. And sometimes we may want to say, how will they hear despite the preacher? But it's not just the preacher. The call to make Jesus known is an individual and corporate call. We proclaim the life of Jesus to bear witness, as John did, formally before the Sanhedrin, but no doubt personally and informally walking the streets of Jerusalem or wherever he travelled. As Alan reminded us, us last night, we are witnesses, whether good or bad witnesses, whether intentionally or otherwise. The question is, what kind of witnesses are we? And what is the message that we give? through our lifestyle, through our words, and through our attitudes of grace and love and humility, and making known the message with clarity. The life we proclaim is the life of Jesus also in you, in me, in us. This is the life I have in Jesus. And John has a concern that they live out the truth that they are people who are alive in Christ. Verse 6, he puts it the other way around. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. We are called to live out the truth, to move from personal reflection upon the wonder of Jesus to personal impact that changes our lives. John looks back and you can imagine himself perhaps still being there, with Jesus in the upper room and came coming to him and saying, and to them and saying, peace be with you, breathing on them his Holy Spirit, saying, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. But that risen Christ, who ascended to be with the Father, has sent his Spirit to be life-changing, life-transforming, equipping and empowering, not just for John, but for us, as well. And there's a sense of wonder, worship, and devotion that pervade both the Gospel of John and this letter. But that wonder understanding leads to a mission mind and a pastoral heart. It's worked out in practice, in the walk of faith, in walking in the light, in the shaping of character and behavior. And so the life that we have in Jesus, I, you have in Jesus, is a life with a new confidence. For we are those who are cleansed sinners. We are cleansed from all sin. 
like the, the messy boy who goes and plays outside, the muck keeps appearing. But he cleanses us again. And as the letter goes on, John reminds us of the cleansing power of Jesus. A new confidence that we are cleansed, forgiven, accepted, reconciled in Jesus. A new humility that recognizes that we are forgiven sinners. We are, as they say, work in progress. We recognize our own fallibilities. But a new family, which is the church, the community of God's people. A sense of fellowship. And John, uh, John talks about that in some measure. A new life, he says. It's from darkness to light, from ignorance to knowledge, from outside to inside, to being part of the family of God. Paul will talk about the kingdom of light. A new calling. John is a changed man. He's changed from, a, from fishing to be a fisher. He has a new pastor, a new purpose. Not all are called away from seeking daily livelihood in secular work. To be set apart for ministry is a privilege. But we're all called to serve the new master, Jesus, and to reflect his standards, his life, in our daily work and tasks. The master is Jesus, and the routine tasks are done for him. The example, the quality of our work, the content of our chat, and the personal advice and witness is for him. And this is probably more challenging than it is for those of us in set-aside ministry. You see, it's easy to preach about it in the context of a church. It's another challenge to do it in the midst of daily life. And we should pray for one another in our daily walk with Christ in his mission, wherever we are. And so we turn from the life of Jesus that we proclaim, the life that we have in Jesus, each one of us, to the life that we have together in Jesus. The word fellowship occurs four times in this chapter, but uh, and actually only in this chapter, but it pervades the rest. The word we is used 20 times in this chapter and 86 times in the letter. Don't worry, I haven't been going through checking them all out, but the computer tells you these things. And children, dear children, or whatever John says, is used many times. A sense of warmth pervades this letter. Our fellowship together should convey that sense of warmth that is obvious to those who come and join us. Our fellowship, writes John, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That fellowship that sets aside private interests, that sets aside personal ambition and joins with others in seeking the desires of the King. John says you can't claim fellowship and walk in darkness. The genuine walking together in Jesus does bring fellowship. And the quality of our fellowship is an indication of our walk with God. Forgive us our trespasses, we pray, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or Jesus in John chapter 13, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And yet that love, that peace that we have in God is sometimes disrupted. Sometimes our narrow focus or even misguided passion and commitment can get in the way of genuine love and fellowship. We're people of conviction. We're dissenters. It's what we do. We disagree. But more important is how we do it. And can we do it in our harmony? Sometimes grace and truth get out of Kilter, out of balance, out of harmony. Sometimes hurt and anxiety results in unhelpful words and actions. Sometimes there are power gains, trying to control things or not to be controlled. And sometimes there is just plain sin in any of its forms. But fellowship is to be pursued with energy and grace. As Paul said, make every effort, every effort. There's a sense of straining. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirits with the bond of this. And the proclamation that John writes about is for fellowship, that they might, those he writes to, might have fellowship with him and their fellowship 
together is with God. And fellowship is for joy, the joy of reconciliation, serious joy, and sometimes serious joy in a fun way. For here, fellowship and reconciliation results in worship, which meets with celebration. Grace is received and grace is shown. Relationships meet with mutual support and relaxed conversation. Openness allows hope, open-hearted and open-minded exploration. Criticism is replaced by loving confidence building. And love overflows into our communities, our wider society, and to the world. For our focus is to be on Jesus, the life we proclaim. God dwelling in the flesh in Jesus. The life we proclaim as individuals is his life flowing through us. And the life that we proclaim is his life living in us together. And proclaim it we must in the whole variety of ways, methods and tools are available. The praise and honour may go to him. And his transforming work may continue in us and in the world that he loves. Amen.